Welcome back to What's in a Villain, where we talk about great villains and what makes them great. Today, we will be talking about the villain from my favorite movie of all time, Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet follows voyeuristic college student Jeffrey Beaumont as he investigates a severed ear he found in a field. This causes him to get tangled up in the case of Dorothy Valens, a singer being held hostage by local drug dealer Frank Booth. Frank is definitely my favorite part of this movie. Without him, this movie would not be nearly as good as it is. Every moment he is on screen is extremely memorable, whether you want to remember it or not. He is the perfect contrast to our main character. While Jeffrey is charming and meek, Frank is boorish and aggressive, the type of man who can and will explode at any moment for the tiniest reasons. As is per usual with this series, we are first going to take a look at how he affects the audience, and then take a deep dive into his character, because despite initial appearances, he is a very complex character. He is from a David Lynch film after all. Anyways, let's begin. The first time we see Frank, he makes sure to make a damn good first impression. Just pure shock value. While Jeffrey is having a sexual escapade with Dorothy at her apartment, someone knocks on the door. Dorothy immediately begins to panic and tells Jeffrey to hide in her closet. This is the first sign that whoever is at the door is not good news. Jeffrey hides and Frank enters the room. The background music cuts off and remains silent for the entirety of the scene making it all the more intense. Dorothy greets Frank, and he immediately tells her to shut up and get him a drink. Frank slowly but surely commands Dorothy to fulfill his every need with a calm intensity that makes the scene all the more scarier. This calmness does not last for long though, as Frank pulls out an oxygen mask and inhales an unknown drug, later specified to be amyl nitrate by actor Dennis Hopper. Frank suddenly becomes ten times more intense, loudly moaning and referring to Dorothy as Mommy. The music then kicks back in, slowly growing louder and louder as Frank gets more and more aggressive, hitting Dorothy and saying that Daddy is coming home. The intensity keeps on building until it finally reaches its peak when Frank rapes Dorothy, with him screaming nonsense the whole time. The scene every now and then will cut back to Jeffrey, hiding in the closet, helpless to do anything. This scene is extremely shocking, but at the same time crazy enough that the audience can't take their eyes away. We, just like Jeffrey, are forced to watch, unable to do anything to help or take our eyes away. The scene also works to show just what depraved acts Frank is capable of, and just how dangerous he is, as well as leave the audience in a state of shock. Frank leaves, and it is revealed that the severed ear Jeffrey found was from Dorothy's husband, who Frank is keeping as a hostage, along with her son, so he can blackmail Dorothy into having sex with him. Jeffrey, visibly shaken, attempts to comfort Dorothy. Jeffrey acts as a mirror of the audience in this scene. Frank has left us disturbed and upset. Later, Jeffrey follows Frank, and it is revealed that not only is Frank a drug dealer, but is also involved in another case where he killed a rival drug dealer and broke a woman's legs. Again, another scene that works to make Frank more intimidating. This is one man that Jeffrey does not want to encounter. But of course, the audience knows that they will meet eventually. And when they do, it makes for one of the most tense situations I've ever seen in a movie. Against his better judgment, Jeffrey decides to visit Dorothy again. The two have sex, and when Jeffrey exits her apartment, someone yells to him from down the hall. The viewer immediately recognizes this voice as Frank, making for a perfect oh shit moment. The second you hear that voice, you know Jeffrey is screwed. Dorothy tries to make up excuses as to why her and Jeffrey were together, and Frank pretends to play along, feigning friendliness. Frank forces Jeffrey and Dorothy in his car with his goons, so they can go for a joyride, as he calls it. This next bit is by far one of the most intimidating sequences I've ever seen in a movie. Jeffrey is stuck in the back of the car with a knife to his throat, with a man who could snap at any time. You can almost feel Jeffrey's anxiety, as he has no idea what horrible fates awaits him, all the while being careful not to set Frank off. If there is one thing Frank's character succeeds at doing, it's making you afraid of what he might do. The gang makes a stop at the mysterious Ben's. 
It turns out this is where Dorothy's husband and son are being held hostage. Frank lets Dorothy see her kid while him and Ben abuse Jeffrey. Ben plays the song In Dreams by Roy Orbison and lip syncs to it. All the while, Frank breaks down and begins to sob uncontrollably. This scene works to make Frank even more unpredictable and scary. It is pretty clear that there is something very wrong with Frank. Frank and the gang leave Ben's and park in an empty lot in the middle of nowhere. Frank begins to take his drugs again and starts assaulting Dorothy. Jeffrey can't take watching helplessly anymore and punches Frank in the face. He immediately regrets this decision. This is where I believe the movie gets the most intense and reaches a fever pitch. The audience and Jeffrey already know what horrible acts Frank is capable of. Now it's just a matter of how pissed off he is, and boy, is he pissed. Frank and his goons drag Jeffrey out of the car, and Frank forcibly French kisses Jeffrey. This is another shocking scene with Frank involving sexual assault. At this point, it's practically his go-to. He then beats the ever-loving crap out of Jeffrey, but leaves him alive. The next day, Jeffrey goes to the police, but finds out that Frank is actually conspiring with a detective there. This makes Frank seem almost unbeatable at this point. There is nothing Jeffrey can do but face him head on and face him he does. Jeffrey lures Frank to Dorothy's apartment, where he hides in the closet again and ambushes Frank. He then shoots him in the head, killing him. This is a mirror of the earlier scene in the movie, where Jeffrey was powerless against Frank whilst hiding in the closet. This time though, Jeffrey uses the closet as a form of power, finally managing to stand up to Frank once and for all. So, now that we have gone over what Frank does, Let's try to figure out why he does what he does. First off, why does he specifically kidnap Dorothy to use as his sex slave? Surely, there are much less risky options for him to get off, like buying a prostitute or something. But it seems like he specifically wants Dorothy. An interview with Frank's actor, Dennis Hopper, reveals why he goes through all that trouble. Dennis says that Frank is truly in love with Dorothy. He is completely obsessed with her. We see evidence of this when Jeffrey sees Frank in the club Dorothy sings at. Dorothy sings the song Blue Velvet, and we see Frank sobbing while clutching a piece of blue velvet cup from Dorothy's nightgown. My interpretation is that the song reminds Frank of his love for Dorothy, which causes him to become overcome with emotion. I believe this interpretation also explains the infamous Beer at Ben's scene. When Ben is lip syncing in dreams, Frank begins to break down and cry. If we take a look at the lyrics of the song, it can be seen as a reference to Frank's total control over Dorothy, and thus, his obsession with her. Here are the lyrics. Then I fall asleep to dream my dreams of you. In dreams I walk with you. In dreams I talk to you. In dreams you're mine. All of the time. That last line in particular reflects Frank's obsession with Dorothy. In fact, it is the very line that causes Frank to break down. This song is used in a different way in the joyride scene. When Frank and his goons beat up Jeffrey, Frank requests that the song be played. Before he beats up Jeffrey, he whispers the same lines above to him as a threat. Again, Frank's interpretation of this song is all about having power, whereas Roy Orbison, the writer of the song, said it was all about being powerless. Frank is very much obsessed with power, so much so that it makes him look almost childish. This is best seen again in the joyride scene. Before Frank beats up Jeffrey, he puts on lipstick and kisses Jeffrey all over his face, leaving lipstick marks everywhere, all while muttering pretty pretty to himself over and over again. To be honest, in retrospect, it is quite silly, and not a very good way to intimidate someone. Frank then forces Jeffrey to feel his muscles while he flexes them, commenting to himself how big they are before finally beating him up. This shows just how childish Frank is. It's something an elementary school bully would do, but this is completely lost on Frank. He is only focused on completely dominating Jeffrey in any way he can. Another sign of Frank's childishness is his obsession with the word fuck. Frank says fuck more times than I can count. It's probably the word he says most in the movie. 
whether you are his enemy or his friend, Frank will refer to you as fucker. Frank also uses fuck as a substitution for many other words. At one point, making a toast to his fuck rather than his health. Whatever that means. Frank seems to put the word on a pedestal, treating it almost with reverence. I believe Frank loves this word since it gives him a sense of power. In modern society, the word fuck is seen as taboo. Because it is such a taboo word, Frank sees it as having a sense of power, and thus uses it constantly to reaffirm his own power. He is saying something taboo, but no one is able to stop him, thus giving him a sense of power over others. Frank's obsession with power is also shown through his curious bedroom habits, which also give us some good insight as to why he is the way he is. Frank enjoys age play, taking on two alter egos in the bedroom, the submissive baby and the abusive daddy. Frank seems to prefer the daddy persona since he uses it more often. I believe that Frank's daddy persona comes as the result of a troubled upbringing. I am by no means a psychologist, but I have read that abused children will sometimes recreate their abuser's actions later in life, creating a cycle of abuse. While in his daddy persona, Frank will beat and berate Dorothy. I think this shows that Frank had a possibly physical and verbally abusive upbringing. Frank also mutters the line, Daddy's coming home, while he is raping Dorothy. This indicates that if Frank was abused, his abuser was most likely his father. Frank also seems to be ashamed of his actions. While he is assaulting Dorothy, he punches her when she looks at him, telling her not to look at him. He also tells Jeffrey not to look at him during the joyride scene. This also makes Frank an inversion of Jeffrey. Whereas Jeffrey is a voyeur and takes pleasure in watching others, Frank cannot stand being watched and will react violently if he is. During particularly intense moments, Frank can often be seen huffing inhalants from an oxygen mask. This drug is confirmed to be amyl nitrite, also known as poppers, by actor Dennis Hopper. Poppers are an inhalant that gives the user intense euphoria when breathed in. Frank relies on poppers in order to gain pleasure. This means that in scenes where he uses them, he is attempting to gain pleasure. This shows us that Frank gains pleasure from things such as rape, assault, and murder. It seems that Frank relies on poppers like a crutch in order to feel pleasure. This indicates that perhaps Frank feels inadequate, and poppers give him all the euphoria he needs to feel confident in himself. Overall, I think Frank is a very damaged person, but in no way does that make him sympathetic. His actions are completely unnecessary, and he is a truly evil man. One of the most delightfully evil villains I have ever seen, in fact. Frank Booth never would have been the same without the late actor Dennis Hopper. He truly makes this character. Rest in peace, Dennis. This movie wouldn't be nearly as good without you. This is CJ Mack signing off. Have a nice tragedy.